You know, one of the things that I read when I first started this podcast was that the average podcast doesn't get past seven episodes. And if you get past seven episodes, you're in the top 50% of podcasts published on the internet. We have surpassed seven episodes. We've got 20 more already planned and in the works. And so we're really excited about that. But it's important to us as we're learning such valuable lessons to be people that are not just hearers, but doers is to go back and reflect a little bit. And so we want to look at the first seven episodes and lessons that we learned from them and highlight a few of our favorite stories. The grindstone. My sunny boy kept his nose to the grindstone. Never give up, never surrender. Brian Davidson was our first guest. He's the CEO of Trayvax, and he regaled us with some incredible stories, including a lot of good hunting stories from his time in Africa. Um, there's one that really stands out to me in particular about hunting baboons. Let's check it out. We hunted baboons at midnight with shotguns and flashlights. Holy cow! And it was just one of those one of those experiences where we're sitting we're sitting in the lodge, and they got this little tiki bar, and we're sitting around, you know, and and watching rugby. And, and when Rick says, hey, you want to go hunt baboons? It's like, yeah, that sounds like fun. When? I said, well, right now. It's like, dude, it's dark outside. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he says, that's all right. Um, so he sends, he had this other guy hunting with us. His name is Andre. And he sends Andre out, and he's speaking Afrikaans. I can't understand a word he's saying. But 30 minutes later, Andre comes back, and he's got um, a couple of shotguns, a roll of duct tape, and a couple of flashlights. And it's like, what the heck is this all about? And so, so I do, do I trust it? Do I go? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking, all right, the kid's 18, but he grew up on this property. It's probably cool. You know, we're probably not going to die. Yeah. And so next thing you know, it's it's like pitch black outside. And I'm trying to follow him down these trails. And there's not even enough light. I mean, I'm three feet behind him. I can barely see it. And then he stops. He says, all right, we're going to get under this tree. And this is one of the trees where these these baboons will rest. Now, in in South Africa, the baboon population has exploded because a lot of the predatory animals have, have, have declined. So there's not as many leopards and lions as there mm, used to be. Gotcha. And so the baboons have really taken over, and they're wiping out other species, especially birds and some of the smaller smaller species. So he said, what we're going to do is we're going to get under the tree, and you're going to turn the flashlight on. And as soon as we do that, if you see eyes, we're going to shoot as fast as we can, and we're just going to shoot as many baboons as we can. And it's like, aren't, aren't baboons one of the most dangerous animals you have here? And he says, yeah, but it's nighttime. We're shooting shotguns. They're just going to try to run away. They're not going to. They're not going to attack. They're just going to run away. And so we get to the first tree, and we we flick on the lights, and and there's nothing. No no baboons, and so it's like, all right, we're going to go to the next spot. So we're walking up this, what they call the Sand River, and I hear this low grumbly growl, and I hear bones crunching, and it's like, oh, Rick, what is that? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it. It's just probably a couple hyenas working over a bush pig or something. Well. I'm in, I'm in grass up to my chest. <laughs> I'm thinking, if a hyena comes after us, even with a shotgun, what am I going to do? He's going to be all over me before I can even see him. Yeah. And But Rick's not worried, and I'm thinking, eh, I guess it's all right. So we, we, we pass up the, the hyenas. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm, I don't get scared easily. And I wouldn't say I'm scared, but the hairs on the back of my neck were yeah. definitely definitely standing up. Well, you're in the elephant graveyard, essentially. And, oh, yeah. You know, Mufasa's not around. That's, that's a, well, yeah. With an 18-year-old yeah. who probably, I don't know about you guys, but when I was 18, thought I would live forever. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, you're, we're all invincible <laughs> at 18. Yeah. yeah. So we, we go by that, and we go to the next tree. And we turn on the flashlights, and there's eyes every place. And so we just all immediately, there's three of us now. And we're you know one of the things Rick had said was, don't shoot them when they hit the ground because we want to clean up afterwards, but we don't want to accidentally shoot each other. Mm -hmm. So we're just lighting up this tree, and it was deafening. You got these baboons screaming. You got wounded baboons falling out of the trees, healthy baboons falling out of the trees, dead baboons falling out of the trees. And it's rain. We're literally, it's just raining baboons <laughs> in the middle of the night. It's, it's, it's pitch, pitch dark. Um, other than our flashlights, and then it's like, all right, let's clean up. And so then we we go and 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 take care of the wounded the wounded baboons. And it was yeah. just, it was one of those nights you just never forget. It'll oh never my gosh. It'll ne never <laughs> no. leave, leave my memory. <laughs> um, Raining baboons from the sky has to be a brand new sentence that's never been spoken in human history. Uh, that was a really great story, and I won't forget it soon. Uh, you know, beyond Brian's hunting stories. It's the principles that he's gathered in his life, I think, that really are a driving force for him. And the story about an empathy uh, and integrity really as the foundation for all of Brian's business and his business decisions is very key as we consider ourselves doers. I'm super family oriented. I want to see my I want to see my kids and my grandkids and their kids yeah. succeed and do and do really well. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of what 
in, on the business front, I, I would say that's one of the main things that drives me. And also, it's just I'm a competitive guy. Mm-hmm. And in business, you know, it's just, you know, you look at the money in business. It's a way of keeping score. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, do I have enough money to quit right now? Yeah, I could I could quit. But I'm, I'm not ready to quit yet. Yeah. And, and so... You know, if you're going to do it, you want to you want to do it to win, and you want to mm-hmm. you want to do your best. And you know, I can tell you a story. I, I view that different than I used to, and I used to want to destroy my comp- competition. I, I not the case anymore. Um, and I was I was up in living in British Columbia, first business I ever owned a portion of, and I had this young kid. I think he was like ten years old. He would come over after school and shoot baskets with me because his dad was working late, and so we'd we'd be playing basketball. Yeah. And I just got to really appreciate this kid. Well, at the same time, in business, we had a communications company, and we had a new competitor came in from Vancouver, BC. Mm-hmm. And this com- this competitor was moving right into our territory, and we decided this this is no good. So we targeted him like crazy. <laughs> he would run a newspaper ad at, for a sale. We'd target the exact same product <laughs> for cheaper, and we just. It's like, we're going to drive this guy out of here. You came to the wrong neighborhood kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Until one day, this 10-year-old kid comes over to my house, and he says, yeah, we're moving back home. And turns out it was his dad I drove out of business. Oh, you're kidding. And no way. His dad had moved from Vancouver over to Kelowna, British Columbia, because he wanted his kid to grow up in an area that wasn't a big city, not as yeah. much crime, not yeah. as much drugs, better family environment. And I tell you what, man, I felt like, I felt like crap. And so, um, yeah, it was a, it was a eye opening experience because when you, when you have comp- competition out there, you got to yeah. remember those are human beings. Also, those are guys that mm-hmm. are trying to make a living for their families and their, for their kids. Yeah. So do I want to win? Yeah, you bet I want to win, but do I want to destroy my competition? Absolutely not. I want to do the best job I can yeah. do and, and the chips fall where they fall and you, and, and you, you hope they're doing a good job and they can be successful too. Um, but it, but it really did change my perspective on that. And so I want to win just by providing the best product and the best price and the best marketing yeah. and the best team for my employees. I want to, I want to do it right, but, but I don't want to destroy anybody. I want to, I want to yeah. go out and, you know, hopefully I can make, make a good living doing what I do and my competitors can make a good living doing what they do and they can take care of their kids and their families as well. You so, raise the level man. for everybody around you. Yeah. What a humbling yeah. experience though. Oh, like, truly, truly. It, truly. It kicked my butt. It yeah, was I can like, only imagine. man. Um, it was, it was a, one of those moments I look back in my life that was really just a poignant experience where it's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta reevaluate, yeah. you know, my, my perspective here. The approach of that, you, what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The second episode, we talked with a beautiful bearded wonder, uh, and, uh, it was me mostly because we didn't have guests lined up, but no, really, I wanted to give, uh, our listeners kind of some background and to the ethos of what drives this podcast. And so um, I share a story about my buddy Tim giving me some very simple steps to accomplish in order to start a project that I was working on. So I want you to take a listen to that and see how his motivation was inspiring. I, when I got the trailer, my friend Tim was starting an online cigar retail business called Cigars Daily. Yeah. And he was launching it with a YouTube channel and the whole nine. And... Um, I went to him for advice. I said, hey, I'm, I got this Airstream. I'm going to turn it into a cigar lounge. Can you give me some advice? And Tim said to me, get your tobacco license mm-hmm. and your all your stuff set up. When you get the paperwork done, give me a holler and we'll hang out. Oh, that's so, smart. so three weeks later, I sent him pictures of the paperwork. And next time I was in Arizona, I stopped in and we spent a couple hours together. And I still have all the notes from when we talked. Yeah. Because he's like, he said, man, in like the, seven plus years I've been doing this. People ask me all the time how to do this kind of business. He goes, and I tell him the same thing. Go get a license. Go, go get your tobacco's license. Just go get that. And he goes, you're the second person in all these years to do that. Come back to me. It's totally. He's like, nobody does this stuff. And so for me, that was a confidence booster. Yeah. And then when COVID hit and I'm working on the second trailer mm-hmm. after I went from being a conference speaker to a phone salesman, right, for this company because <laughs> there's no more conferences. Yeah. And my my boss came out to have lunch with me one day, and we sat in the half-built trailer, and I had the other one at my place because I was refurbishing some of the stuff in it. And he's like, do you ever think about just going back and talking to your middle school self and being like, man, don't worry, dude, you're going to be a badass someday. Yeah. And I thought that's funny because that's not a – I would never say that that's what I am. 
Sure, sure. But like talking to this guy who's been around for a while to see like, oh, this is really unique what I'm doing. Yeah. Like again, that's a that's a pivotal moment. That's that's the day I started writing about the podcast stuff. Yeah. Because I thought there's other people like that. I know a lot of them. Yeah. Let's start I should start talking about this stuff. But that was 4 years ago now. Um or three and a half, four years ago. Yeah. Um when that really started to take shape. And now here we are, right? Yeah. In a studio that I worked for two months on and, well, you know. It, it's the, you know, the same thing I was saying before. It's like you put it out there, you put it in your journal or what have you. You just, like, even that guy saw that in you and was like, just wouldn't you tell yourself you're going to be a badass, right? It's yeah. like, it's true, though. I mean, like, not everyone does this. Wow, like, I don't know if... um that last big project of my Tim Can Cigar Company would have ever happened without Tim and his advice. And I'm going to always be grateful to him. And that conversation was a pivotal moment, not only in the project, but also in my life. And that leads me kind of to the point that I wanted to draw from the episode. And it was the importance of writing things down. So let's take a listen to what the old wise one has to say. Yeah, there's a study. I want to say it was Stanford. So over a decade ago, and they found that anything you write down, mm -hmm. you're 42% more likely to accomplish that thing. Ugh. And I thought, those are pretty good odds. Yeah. So I keep idea books, and yeah. I just start writing stuff down. And I find that when I go back and look in those books, I'm like, oh, I forgot about, well, I was kind of building that idea a little bit. But so expand, many of- You expand them sometimes? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So many of the things that I've built over the years and done or whatever, it all comes out of, I just wrote it down. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to talk to somebody about it. It's another thing to, like, write it down. Uh, our third episode we filmed before we had even started really doing the podcast. But my buddy Talon Sai was up in the area. And, uh, you know, I've, I've known Talon to be the darling of overland adventuring. And so uh, I was excited to sit down with him. But the thing that was most fascinating to me in his story was the amount of work that goes into producing a YouTube channel behind the scenes. And so let's take a listen to that story. What about your film crew and your editing team? That's me. I do everything. I mean, I, I didn't, you guys haven't even really seen me like film a video yet as far as like vlog style goes, but, um, yeah, I do everything start to finish. I'm all self-taught. I, I don't have any background in video editing. That or, wasn't one of your two degrees at Penn state. No, I, my two degrees were information sciences and technology. And then I had a minor in security risk analysis. So like good, great degrees. I mean, in today's world, I can always fall back on those if I needed to, but yeah, not trained in video editing, photography, videography, or anything like that. Um, I run the camera. I do all my emails, do all my phone calls. Um, I do literally everything start mm -hmm. to finish. And and a lot of stuff, like, people will see what I do, and they're like, oh, your life's so cool. Like, you just travel and just have fun. Um, and they don't see, like, 85 90% of everything else that I'm doing. So, yeah. and I'm not complaining at all. I mean, it, I'm, I'm just saying it's a lot of work. I work more now working for myself than I ever worked at my IT job. Huh. I yeah. bet. Yeah. And, and it's, that's one of those things where it's like, I'm working for myself sink or swim. I have to do it. But working at the IT job after a while, like I felt like just another number, they didn't really care about what I was doing. So if I work nine to five and checkouts at five, I'm done. Like, don't call me. I'm not doing any work after yeah. that. So uh, that's unfortunately just how the world is now. Yeah. When you think about people that are creating content, you just think about them, all the work they're doing in front of the camera, but it's really the work behind the camera that makes the difference. And that's what I love about Talon's transparency in that story. Um, but beyond that, it was him saying that you have to make the choice to do hard things and no one else is going to do it for you uh, to get yourself motivated. And so that's a really great principle. Let's take a listen to what Talon has to say. I feel like with the internet nowadays, you can probably turn almost any hobby into something that makes you money in some way, shape or form, whether it's like a product or just creating content, which it's not for everyone. I mean, I'm not going to recommend like anyone go out there and just try to start a YouTube channel. Um, you have to have the passion to do it. Uh, you can't start creating content thinking you're going to make money because most people don't. Um, it's, yeah, a, a lot of people will fail very early on because of that mentality. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a shame. But uh, I know that was a big circle answer, but I think that yeah. covered most of it. I mean, I think essentially what you're saying is is that, you know, there comes a point where you just have to make a decision to to 
take a risk. Yeah. I mean, no one's going to do it for you. Yeah. Like you, you have to be in tune with yourself. You have to be able to control your emotions, your feelings. Um, yeah. You have to do it for yourself because no one else is going to do it for you. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, speaking of writing things down, when I first started writing down the ideas for this podcast over three years ago, Mark Bjorklund's name was the first one I put in there as a potential guest. And here we are. Episode four, Mark Bjorklund. It's an incredible story. And probably of all of his stories about land speed racing in Bonneville, it was the one where he loses his vision while going over 200 miles an hour on a motorcycle. Take a listen. So it's like the last day, and it's so hot, and you're in black leather, and you have Good friends Lord. and family holding the umbrellas, and you're drinking water. And I was about to go, and we got to get the bike unloaded and pointed at the course. And, you know, it's a whole thing. And, um, and so I had my helmet and I was like breathing underneath it, like, oh. And then the flag dropped. Okay. Well, I never cinched the strap because oh. I had been like breathing out the bottom of yeah. it. <laughs> so then, uh, then I take off and I'm shifting through the gears. But before I left, I had put my phone, I had turned on my GPS and stuffed it in my jacket, like for whatever reason. Yeah. And I get into the last gear and I'm getting up to speed and I make that one last course correction. I remember I was like kind of going to the left and I turn towards the tower. The tower's right in the middle of the flying mile. And then all of a sudden my helmet flips up. <gasps> and so the mouthpiece is over my eyes. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez. And I start flipping. I start flipping my head and, and I won't back off. <laughs> I don't know why, but I wouldn't back off. I was like, no, it'll come down. It'll come down. Go on. And about the 10th whip, the wind caught it and pulled it down. And I was like, okay. And there's all four flags right in front of me. I had veered all the way over. I'm going 200 and some miles an hour, and there's all four flags, and they have these giant PVC teepees that hold them up. Yeah. You know, they're like 10 feet tall. Yeah. They're big flags. And I was like, Oh shoot. And zipped right underneath them. But I know that I'm going out of bounds and I'm thinking about the tower like, oh boy. And for some reason I started dragging my foot. I mean, I let off on the throttle right away. Sure. Yeah. And I started dragging my foot just out of a reaction because you're going into the rough salt that's not the groomed course. Uh-huh. So it's like And so then um I steered out of it and steered back onto the course and i was like well my run is ruined so i might as well just get off the course and i blasted back down onto the track and pulled off at the end and and so i pulled off by the tent that's down there and i threw the bike down and i went running over there i was like you got to stop the course stop the course i i blew up the eyes or the you know the metering system i you know i went th i knew that i had mm. done some damage to it yeah so they radio the tower, and then I'm like, oh, I have Rex's phone number, the head official up there. So I call him up. I'm like, Rex, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I ruined racing for everybody. He's like, Mark, I'm standing here by these flags, and I can see your tire track. Nothing happened. Everything's fine. I was like, sweet. Huh. Yeah. So I, I happened to miss, you know, the eye or the timing light was like, over eight or 10 feet Jeez. that way. And the height of the flag started just high enough that I shot underneath and the PVC, like if that hit your hand. Oh yeah. You imagine. Your mouse power? Yeah. So then I was like, Oh, that's right. I, you know, I, I didn't get a time because I missed the timing light. Uh -huh. I pull out my phone two ten. Oh, you're kidding no. me. <laughs> Cause your GPS, that's genius. <laughs> so I started laughing. I was like, I just went 210 miles an hour trying to get my helmet With to your... come back to oh, Come on, God. come on, come on. That might be either the bravest or the craziest man I have ever known. Uh, Mark is uh, really an inspiration. And beyond being an inspiration of bravery, Mark is also an inspiration for hard work. Mark talking about the pushing through the temptation to quit, that really stood out to me as an important principle. So let's take a listen to what Mark had to say about pushing through. And funny story, it was like one month before Bonneville, and I walked into the shop and I was like, Carl, I'm, it'll go, but maybe I'll do some test runs, but 
it's it's just I cannot get it done in time. Mm. And that was on like a Friday, and he was like, "Yeah, bummer." And then I thought about it all weekend, and I was like, "No, this is the Bonneville story. This is what mm. we do. We yeah. roll up our sleeves." And Monday morning, I hit the ground running again, and was like, "No, I'm gonna make it." Yep. And um, and somehow got it done in time. Jeez. But you. It, it's two inches off the ground. You can't test run it anywhere. No. And you can't, you know, so it's like, and then you bring it to Bonneville and you're at the parking lot and the hotel and all of the <laughs> other racers are there and yeah. everybody's walking up and looking at it and they're like, who's going to ride this? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you're already part of a group of the crazies. Yeah. Yeah. And then the crazies are calling you crazy. <laughs> so yes. then you're like. Man, what did I do? Yeah. The next episode we're going to highlight is my buddy Chu Garcia, a tattooist and a very talented illustrator. Um, Chu had some really colorful stories, my favorite being the bike bonfire story. Check it out. So about once or twice a month, there was this guy named George Rote, and he lived in a trailer park towards the outside of town with about 80 to 90% of all these people that I'm tattooing. All wow. right. All these bikers. And um, he used to have a party, and I'd go there, and I would and I would party, and I would tattoo. You know, a tattoo party. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. all these bikes, and it's this trailer. This trailer park is kind of, you get off the road, and it's kind of like in a C shape here. And so there's a row of trailers here. You know, there's a driveway. There's a place for a bomb fire. And then there's another row behind that of trailers. Yeah. Okay? okay? And so... Um, like I said, I'm used to going over there and all that kind of stuff. But now I want a bike because yeah. I want to be like these guys. You want to be in the club. Right? Yeah. And so now it's stemming from like when I was seven. Yes. Right? <laughs> totally. And so I go out, man, and and I think I'm I'm the shit, you know. So I go out here and I buy this Honda CB 4, 400, 450 or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's 1983, man. And so the word like no Jap crap is everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. You know what American I mean? Yeah. American so made, you know, yeah. so it's like, we don't want no Hondas. We don't want any of that stuff. So anyways, I buy a Honda and, you know, and I go get me a pair of engineer boots and a leather jacket, you know, and, uh, I already know these guys. So I, I go get me some booze and my tattoo gear and I'm set up, man. Like I'm feeling good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm doing the Lord's work out here. <laughs> man, I'm feeling good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm full of myself, you know, yeah. like I'm like, yeah, I'm going to roll into this party. And these guys are going to see me on this bike and they're going to be like, yeah, this kid's. The <laughs> so I go roll up and there's about 30 bikes there already. Yeah. And, uh, as I pull up, man, the bonfire is going and stuff. And as I pull up, everyone's kind of looking at me like this. You know, eyes wide open. A couple of them are, like, shaking their heads. Like, what the hell is this? And I'm thinking, yeah, I got him, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Speechless. Yeah, yeah. A prodigal son, <laughs> you know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> so anyways, man, I get off the bike, and this huge man comes over. His name's uh, Brett. Comes over and grabs my bike and rolls it right into the bomb fire. <laughs> How much did this cost you? <laughs> it was 300 bucks. Oh, my goodness. It was 1983. Yeah, you know? yeah, but still, quite a bit back but, then, too. Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And, uh, he, so, and so I'm like, I'm like, and now everyone's laughing and they're partying. Sure. And they're, <laughs> like, having a great time over the death of my bike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, like, confused and shattered. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Quickly, George's uh, girlfriend comes out, Cindy. She grabs me. She takes me inside this trailer. Yeah. And it's like kind of in the center so I can see everything that's happening. I'm in the kitchen of this like old 70s trailer, right? She sits me down, opens up a beer, sits it there in front of me, lights up a cigarette. And I'm going off, man. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I'm cussing, man. I'm yeah. going off. I'm like, I'm not going to stand for this. And this dude, George, that I, that I respected, he raised his voice to me and he said, shut up. Like, seriously, it was like a bolt of lightning. He's like, shut up. Yeah. And so I shut up. You know, I'm confused, man. I'm like yeah. blown away. Yeah. They threw some Easy Rider magazines down, and they started to explain to me 
why they don't want jab crap and why Harley Davidson is important at that time and uh. American made and supporting mm-hmm. American jobs and all this kind of stuff and explain to me why Brit did that. Oh, I don't know, about a half hour, 45 minutes into it, Brett comes in and he says, what'd you pay for that piece of shit? I was like, 300 bucks. He threw 300 bucks on the table. He said, don't do it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he walked out. I tell that story all the time. It just blows my mind. This is just a completely different world than the one I know, and I love you for sharing it with us. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I didn't expect from a, a biker in his 50s who does tattoos all of his life is the motivation for self-care behind creativity. And it was the advice that you gave us about that that I think really stood out to me from the episode. Um, Step away. Go do something else. Let your mind rest a little bit. I think most artists are just spinning and spinning and spinning, you know? Especially now with social media and everything, we never stop. We never stop. You know, go camping. Go do something. Walk away, you know? As far as not being not as far as like not wanting to create anymore, you know, at my age, I've been through that a couple of times, especially with tattooing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you can't create, I think you got to use that time. I went through a, a really hard time creating, and uh, I quit drinking. Mm. You know, yeah, I got a little bit more uh, into my spirituality, yeah, and. Um, Stepped away from a little bit. And then when I came back, I came back. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. A you new know. focus, a new vision. Gosh, that's such a good you know. answer. Mark Kotrowski uh, is a filmmaker and on the side owns his own coffee company, makes high-end coffee. I think it was the story about Mark going to Guatemala and meeting the family of farmers that makes the coffee that really stood out to me. So let's go to Guatemala with Mark and take a listen. So tell us about where you got this coffee from. Yeah, so this coffee comes from um, Guatemala, Guatemala uh, in the region of Huehuetenango, um, which is deep in, deep in Guatemala. Um, I was actually there, went to the farm last February. Uh, we've been partnering with this family for now four harvests. Um, they are just spectacular, just yeah. entrepreneurs. Um, like really cool, easygoing people invited me into their home. We had like shared like one of their like traditional beverages together. Wow. They toured me around their farm, um, kind of everything they do. They were extremely grateful for me buying the coffee, but also yeah. I was also very grateful for them growing like a really spectacular coffee. And so it was just this like mutual, like, Dude, we're just in this together. Yeah. We live in completely opposite sides of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, very different people, but we're still evolving around this beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, hopefully that, you know, people like you guys can just in- drink it at home. I love that story because it really starts to peel back the layers on something that I think we all consume every day but take for granted. That's something that I've really come to value about cigars is you know, I've learned that it takes 300 hands to make one cigar. And in the same way, when we get to look under the hood a little bit about how coffee's made, it's an exciting and great adventure. Uh, So I really appreciate Mark sharing that. I'm also grateful to Mark because gratitude is really the driving force behind all that he did, sharing about sacrifices that his dad made so that he could have the life that he wanted. And he has this phrase where he says, you go until you win. And it was that kind of determination that comes out of gratitude, I think, that really stood out to me. So let's take a listen to that story. Despite the challenges that I grew up with, um... I'm so thankful. I would not want to have it any other way because I, I literally think that this mentality, the extreme thankfulness that I feel every day waking up for work is because I saw my dad, literally, you guys, I'm not kidding you, went to his day job, worked all night, came home at 4 a.m., woke up at 10, went to another side. Like, like we grew up re- really like not having anything. And the fact that I can like, wake up and now choose to do what I do when my dad was like, dude, can somebody just pay me? Because I can work. I can work my ass off. I can hustle my way through. I don't know how to speak English. I, you know, don't have any education. Like going from that Mm -hmm. to like, I'm waking up every, every day and I get to do my dream job. Yeah. Come on. And I'm sure he was probably pretty positive too. What's up? Well, he was probably a pretty positive guy as well. Huh? Oh, my my dad is yeah yeah. He's he's an optimist, right? He's he's like he's very positive. Even yeah, I'm I 
there's there's so much that I'm so thankful for. Yeah. Um, he's he wasn't perfect, you know. Sure. Parents all have you know their own downfalls and upsides, but I'm so thankful for just his like. There's a way you can do this if you freaking work hard, if you go at it, mm-hmm. if you try. Mm-hmm. There's an opportunity, and you go until you win. Yeah. Finally, we interviewed a professional gamer who is also a grandma. She goes by Tactical Grandma. And her husband and Sean and her uh, share about what it's like starting a professional gaming career in your mid-50s. And they share an incredible story about overcoming hate with kindness. Take a listen. I think one of the things I love most about your streams are when you do encounter toxic individuals, how you handle them. Yeah. Most of the time I handle them nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes nice. I'm a, she, tra- I, she tries to show yeah. how you be kind, but you don't mm-hmm. roll yeah. over and just take it. Mm-hmm. For sure. You, you know, you, you stand up for yourself. I think my thing is like, way. Oh, did your mom not hug you this morning? I'll give you a hug. That's yeah, like, I love that because that turns that around. Yeah, yeah. like, oh, it's still my mom, my mom didn't hug me. You're, you're like keeping yeah. burning coals on your head. How yeah. did you know? Yeah. Turn it. Do you but have any? You know, oh, there's though, real quick. There's one story where a guy came in and he was trolling and being mm, really nasty. Chat, yeah. And uh, and she said, hey, you know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you're having a hard day, you know, but that that isn't kind. Yeah. Are, are you just having a rough day? He's and like, and he's am. like, I am having a rough day. And she said, well, tell me what's going on. And that particular person, you know, her her moderators were saying, she would, do we kick him out? And she's like, no, give him a chance. Let's see where he's going with this. Yeah. Good on and you. Uh, yeah. Good on he you. ended up we being tried. in chat yeah. after that yeah. for a long time. Mm-hmm. He changed dramatically. And she's like, well, I'm wow. sorry you're having yeah. a, a bad day, but you're here now. And, uh, you know, you don't. Yeah, you're not having a bad day now. You're in here with us. It's, wow. it's like that. Um, you can get attention both ways, whether yeah. it's positive or it's negative, right? I'm yep. always telling my kids like, you want to do the positive. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. I never get tired of hearing tactical grandma stories. Uh, she is such an entertaining person. I stream her often, just hoping I can catch one of these stories as they happen in real life. They're so entertaining. I think the principle that I really drew away from this episode is that it's never too late to pursue your dreams and do things that you never thought you could do. I think you would say that Tattle Grandma lived a pretty normal, mundane life, though she would say it's been a very rich life. But this is really the cherry on top to get to do something that you love as your profession. Let's listen to what Tattle Grandma did. To be a professional gamer. I don't think of myself as an influencer, but you know. You're on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> as we as pull well. this out. Yeah. As we're gonna pull yeah. this out. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Gamer <laughs> magazine. Gamer magazine. Yeah, it's so weird. Do <laughs> you, you ever think you would see yourself on no. a magazine cover? No. No. <laughs> now here's the thing that's interesting to me, and I want to get a little bit more into your meteoric rise. <laughs> but the thing that's really interesting to me is you're you're a mom, a grandma, a bus driver for a season. Yeah. Mm. Taco um, Bell manager. Taco Bell manager. <laughs> hey. Amazing. Five yeah. layer burrito. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think in my late fifties I'm gonna be a professional gamer yeah. with no. millions of people watching me? No. She never couldn't have I thought mean, that. I never thought even when I started, I never thought anybody would watch, right? And yeah. it still kind of floors me that people are not watching. I'm like, dang, I better do good because you guys are in here. But <laughs> yeah. really for because there's different kinds of content creators, right? There's the guys who are like super cracked at the game and they, you know, get tons of kills a game and that's what people are there for. And they don't talk to their chat as much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's what people want to see is that gameplay. And then there's people that are more entertaining and and welcoming and that's where I fall in. We're just a place where, yeah, I'm not that great at the game, but I do decent. Um you destroy people. Yeah, well, I mean, I say, I've I'm not the like video. these guys, right? So I'm, I'm like right here. It's, but but I think it's kind of relatable to people too because they're like, well, I mean, I could maybe try to do that. And I've had a lot of people start yeah. playing video games that never played video yeah. games yeah. because they watched me. Yeah, we've heard lots of inspirational yeah. stories. Especially a lot of females. Yeah, yeah. bad. Yeah. 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 They're like, wow, but I'm actually even kind of getting the courage maybe even talk in these lobbies because yeah. they wow. hear it too, right? It's, it's not fun being a... F- I mean... They hear your voice sometimes, and they just start calling you horrible things. That's terrible. I, I saw. I saw. Uh, there's a lot of highlights of you destroying people that are yeah. being horrible to you. Yeah, which is, yeah. The, the best. internet is littered with them, and it, <laughs> it is very entertaining. So when you uh, are in those situations, like, w- are there any that stand out to you? Like, this was a really fun one for me to uh, to dominate. Not really. See, I have such a bad memory. 
so I don't remember. I, I can all, help you. I can help you. <laughs> I love it. He's my memory. There is one. Mama there is win. one where the guy, uh, you know, called her some nasty names and said, "Go make me a sandwich." And uh, I'll and be basically a prostitute. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said some <laughs> some choice words, and uh, like immediately, as soon as he could communicate with her, because they have something called prox chat in Call of Duty. Yeah. So when you get near enough to another team, oh, you, yeah, you was, can now yeah, talk yeah. to them. Yeah. So as soon as she was in proximity to this team, this guy starts spouting off all this nasty stuff and says, "Go make me a sandwich, you you know yeah. b word." And so she jumps off her roof onto his and just annihilates him and says, "Eat my sandwich, bro." I saw that one. That I saw that one. It's so yeah. funny. Yes. It's yeah. just like, oh I my love gosh, that. we're yeah. all dying I laughing. I totally saw that video. <laughs> wow. Like I, again, I just love tactical grandma stories and it's so inspiring to me. I hope that as we reflected on these last seven guests, you found something that really stood out to you, maybe motivated and excited you about this. Um, that kind of concludes our recap video, but I want to thank you, first of all, as a listener, to tuning into our first seven uh, episodes, eight if you count Santa Claus and Bitcoin. Um, but I want to thank you for that, and I want to encourage you. You know, it's it's not just about learning new things, but it's also reflecting on what's already been taught. And sometimes we're so quick to want to learn something else that we forget what's been spoken. And so that's why we felt it was important to do this recap episode. We have some incredible guests coming up. And I want to encourage you that in 2024 that you don't just continue to listen to the podcast but you take those principles, maybe you write them down uh, in a little journal or on your phone as a reminder, and you get out there and you become somebody that's not just a hearer, but a doer also. Go get them. <laughs>